Hi, folks. Uh, before our speakers begin, I'd like to note a few logistics. So all attendees are currently in listen-only mode, but following our speakers' remarks, we will open the webinar up to questions. Um, throughout the presentations, please type your questions into the chat box, which we will then address during the question and answer period. Uh, so we'll prioritize questions from members of the media, so if you are press, please include your name and the outlet you're representing in the chat box. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and we will send a link to the registrants after the webinar. So before we begin, I wanted to introduce our panelists. We're joined by Stephen Nadell, Executive Director at ACEEE, Dave Ribeiro, Senior Research Manager of Local Policy at ACEEE, Jacob Fry, the Mayor of Minneapolis, welcome. Carl Spector, the Environment Commissioner for the City of Boston, welcome. Debbie Raphael, the director of the San Francisco Department of the Environment, very early for her, welcome. And I will now turn it over to Steve Nadell at ACEEE to start us off. Okay, thank you, Casey, and welcome everyone to our webinar about the uh, 2019 City Clean Energy Scorecard. This is ACEEE's fourth uh, city scorecard, but it's our most comprehensive uh, uh, city scorecard ever. We've expanded the scorecard to include 75 different cities, all uh, including the 25 cities in the American uh, Cities Climate Challenge. Uh, we're including a variety of renewable energy metrics for the first time, and also taking a closer look at the performance of policies, not just whether cities have policies, but uh, to the extent we can, how they are performing. And then we've also continued to expand the equity uh, focus in this scorecard. Uh, how well are some of these programs serving marginalized communities and are they involving in the communities in the planning of these pro uh, programs and policies? But uh, in a second, you'll hear a lot more about all of these. Let me turn it back to Casey. Thanks, Steve. I will now turn it over to Dave Ribeiro at ACEEE, the lead author of the city scorecard. He will discuss the City Scorecard's key findings. Dave? Great. Thanks, Casey. Good morning, everyone. I'll be presenting the City Scorecard's key findings. The Scorecard ranks 75 large U.S. cities on their efforts to achieve a clean energy future by improving energy efficiency and scaling up renewable energy. It identifies those that excel and those with the most room to improve. The report highlights actions cities can take to achieve their clean energy goals. We also look at city efforts to incorporate equity into planning and program delivery, capturing the extent to which city actions are based on community input and are designed to serve all residents. We developed the scores by evaluating each of the 75 cities on policy metrics across five areas, namely government operations, community initiatives, buildings, utilities, and transportation. When combined, the results from these policy areas provide a total score for each city that allows us to rank them. So let's go ahead and get right to the results. Thanks, Dave. Okay. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's OK. Uh, this map up here ranks the, uh, or shows the ranks of all 75 cities in the report. Boston retains its first place ranking. It remains the only city to have held the top spot in any edition of the city scorecard. The city performed well across the report but excelled in building policies and energy and water utilities. Its notable efforts include its building energy code, its benchmarking policy, and the Renew Boston program. It's followed by San Francisco, Seattle, Minneapolis, and Washington, DC. Each has continued to push the envelope. For example, San Francisco adopted a carbon neutrality goal in 2018 and advanced parking policies to enhance location efficiency. Minneapolis has also taken bold steps in just the last few months with a series of policies to increase energy efficiency in homes and apartment buildings. Rounding out the top 10 are New York, Los Angeles, Denver, Austin, and Portland. I wanted to recognize some other notable cities too. San, Francisco, or San Jose rather, ranked 11th. The city came extremely close to breaking into the top 10, coming within a half point of tying Portland. Their improvement was driven by their new benchmarking ordinance, the Energy and Water Performance Ordinance. Next, Oakland ranked 12th. Of the 24 cities new to the scorecard this year, they earned the highest ranking. Finally, Orlando ranked 15th. With its continued pursuit of energy efficiency and renewable en energy, Orlando has taken over the top spot in the Southeast. 
Past editions of the scorecard recognized most improved cities. We have removed that designation because the extensive methodology improvements made comparisons with the 27 scorecard difficult. But we still wanted to recognize cities that made substantial policy progress since the last report. To do so, we created the Cities to Watch category. These cities stand out for adopting several major clean energy policies and programs since early 2017. We also focus on cities outside the top 10 as we sought to identify emerging cities. Cities to watch are Cincinnati, Hartford, and Providence. Cincinnati adopted the Green Cincinnati Plan, committing itself to a suite of clean energy goals. Cincinnati also took steps to reduce energy in the transportation sector. Similarly, Hartford took several steps to improve in transportation policies due to its work around zoning and parking policies. It also created an energy improvement district to better allow for distributed energy systems. Providence has permitted PACE financing, offered workforce development programs, and most notably committed itself to engaging low-income communities and communities of color in its environmental planning processes. If they keep at it, each city will move up future rankings. Looking across cities, we found that cities are taking concrete steps to achieve a clean energy future. The scale of action is impressive. We found cities had taken more than 265 new initiatives between January 2017 and April 2019. Some of these are practical, impactful policies, like Philadelphia's teleworking policy for municipal employees. Others are cutting edge, like Washington, D.C.'s building performance standards. The new policies weren't isolated to cities at the top or just the cities to watch. We found that more than 65 cities pursued a new initiative. As the figure shows, we saw progress across the board. The adoption of climate goals has the most overall uptake. For buildings policies, required energy actions, and updated building codes had significant uptake, as did parking policy improvements and mode shift targets for transportation. We also looked at progress towards near-term climate goals by looking at trends in cities' emission profiles. We found progress towards goals to be uneven. While the majority of cities have goals, slightly more than a third do not. Of the 49 cities with goals, 22 are not yet fully tracking their progress. Of the 22 cities with goals and data to assess them, 11 cities are on track for their goals with another eight projected to make substantial progress, but still fall short. What does this mean? First off, 22 cities having goals, but not fully tracking progress stands out. We hope over time that more data becomes available so we can get a better picture of cities' progress towards goals across the country. Second, the 27 cities for which we assess progress. If you look at cities on track and close to being on track, that's 19 of 27, which isn't bad, but, but clearly with only 11 cities projected to be on track, there's room to improve. I see scoring as a reminder for cities to be vigilant. Some cities will need to redouble their efforts. In other cases, it's possible that some cities' recent policy actions and the resulting GHG emissions reductions from them haven't showed up in emissions profiles yet. Future scorecards will shed light on that. That being said, based on the scale of improvement or an, an action I was just referring to in the previous slide, I am hopeful that cities' extensive policy progress over the past two years will help them close the gaps we're seeing. The report had a number of other takeaways, as I summarize here. For example, we found emerging efforts exist to increase engagement of clean energy, energy investments for low-income communities and communities of color. In particular, equity-driven planning models in Minneapolis, Providence, and Seattle are encouraging. Across cities, though, there's still a lot more work to do. Other findings are related to buildings, the transportation <laughs> sector, and state policy. If anyone has questions about them, I'm happy to discuss further during the Q&A. And with that, I'll turn it back to Casey. Great. Thanks, Dave. I'd now like to turn it over to Mayor Jacob Fry of Minneapolis. Mayor? Hello, this is Jacob Fry. First, uh, just thank you. Um, really proud to be working with the ACEEE. And thank you, Casey and uh, Stephen and David. Uh, we really appreciate your work. And we've got a lot of great things that are happening right now in Minneapolis. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't actually mention the people who are actually doing the work, which are you know Kim Havey and Luke Hollenkamp, as well as Heidi Ritchie from my office and uh, some really great council members and their staff. And so we've We've done a bunch of great things. Uh, you know, we've, we've designated the green zones in both north and south side of Minneapolis and areas that ex experience a 
cross section of both poverty and pollution and we try and prioritize resources to those areas. Um, secondly, and this was sort of already mentioned, is we've opened our energy disclosure policy to comprehensively include all residential properties in uh, Minneapolis by 2021. We've already had the disclosure for commercial, but uh, adding it to, to residential was really key. And we've been benchmarking disclosure uh, and evaluation requirements for uh, large multifamily buildings and energy performance and lease requirements so that tenants uh, know the energy use of their buildings. Uh, plus, we're also including uh, an energy evaluation disclosure requirements at the point of home sale to ensure that energy use is part of the decision-making process when people decide to move forward and get a home. Uh, and so that includes everything from you know, residential energy benchmarking based on building, building size, extending the existing commercial benchmarking ordinance to cover residential buildings, uh, we've got a, a time of rent energy disclosure that requires uh, residential building owners to disclose average energy cost per square foot. Um, so yeah, we're working on a bunch of great things and it, and it all goes towards uh, an, an overarching goal of, uh, of really shifting towards, uh, you know, towards uh, carbon reduction and, and, and getting full electric use uh, in the next couple of years here. Uh, and so we're we're going to get Minneapolis to 80% GHG emissions or 80% reduction by uh, 2050. Um, and uh, we've also got some clear goals on electricity by 2025 and 2030. So, uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you. We're, we're really proud to work with you. You know, um, I, normally I don't cheer a, a fourth place finish, but in this case, uh, we are really pumped about it here in Minneapolis and, and can't you know, wait to continue working with you all in the future. Great. Thanks, Mayor Fry. Uh, I'd now like to turn it over to Carl Spector, the Environment Commissioner for the City of Boston. Carl? Thank, thank you very much. This is Carl Spector. I'm a Commissioner of the Environment for the City of Boston, and it's, it's a great honor to be recognized by ACEEE again for being uh, the, the leading uh, clean energy uh, city in the United States. And we know it's a particular honor because of all the great work that is being done in other cities across the country, as, as Mayor Fry uh, just, just described. You know, one of the reasons we know that we're able to succeed in Boston, that it's a whole city effort. We are very fortunate that we have uh, amazing support for this work, uh, just not, uh, of course, from Mayor Martin J. Walsh and the city council, but from institutions, businesses, and residents across the city, many of whom are adopting more aggressive uh, targets uh, for clean energy and greenhouse gas, gas reduction than the city itself has. Uh, Boston has a, a goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, and uh, we know that what one thing that that takes is continuous improvement. Uh, we are uh, monitoring our greenhouse gas emissions with our yearly inventory. And uh, we are now up, um, embarking or in the middle of the third update of our climate action plan, because uh, as David mentioned, we know we have to continue to push the elements, uh, uh, push the envelope as many other cities in the country are doing. Uh, we know that the work that we're doing uh, for uh, greenhouse gas reduction and a, a, a clean economy uh, is important for our economy and jobs. Uh, the work of retrofitting buildings across the city to make them more efficient will generate many good, uh, good, uh, good jobs for all sectors of the community. We're doing that uh, through, you know, intensive work on our own uh, municipal operations to increase the efficiency and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from municipal operations. And this year, uh, we have new requirements as part of our energy reporting ordinance for a privately owned buildings for the first time. Uh, they now have to report on actions or audits that they are taking uh, in their own buildings to identify and take action to increase the efficiency there. And we're working with uh, new many of our partners to increase the training available uh, so that the residents of Boston uh, know what to do in terms of running the building and in fulfilling the requirements for retrofits and the other needs 
of the clean economy. Uh, we're also very focused on our equity efforts. Uh, we are expanding our uh, Renovate Leaders program by which we're training members of all uh, communities uh, in the various parts of the city and the different uh, language groups of the city so that uh, members of those communities can do the work of spreading the word and letting people know of the opportunities available uh, for increased efficiency and the opportunities to uh, participate in the policy setting um, efforts that the city is undertaking. And, and finally, I want to say a very important of the work we're doing is the partnership across cities. City, cities uh, across the city and around the world are sharing information so that we are learning from uh, each other's work and uh, advancing the action collectively. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, I'd now like to turn it over to Debbie Raphael, the director of the San Francisco Department of the Environment. Debbie? Thank you so much. I'm uh, deeply honored to be in the company of such great cities like Boston and Minneapolis. I love those cities. We uh, work with them all the time to learn from their best practices and share our experiences. And I appreciate greatly ACEEE's leadership and advocacy for energy efficiency and climate action. And we're thrilled to be recognized this year. Uh, it feels like our recent efforts are paying off and we're honored to be in that number two spot. And just like the mayor said, it's hard not to be number one, but that pushes us all to celebrate what we have done and to work even harder. And I would say that energy efficiency is truly a key part of our overall climate action strategy. San Francisco's climate action strategy can be summarized in four words, four goals, zero, 80, 100 routes, zero, zero waste to landfill and incineration, 80, 80% 80 trips in sustainable modes, 100, 100% renewable energy, which of course includes efficiency, and roots, that is how we support our urban forest, biodiversity, use our compost on rangeland to support carbon sequestration. And so the beautiful thing about ACEEE's scorecard is how thorough and comprehensive it is because it reflects so much of our climate action strategy. The survey examined things we commonly think of as energy efficiency, like building energy codes and rebates. And we're very proud of San Francisco's innovative green building codes and long running energy efficiency programs that have improved tremendously the quality of life and affordability for our small businesses and disadvantaged communities. In 2017, 64% of San Francisco's electricity was generated by renewable resources. And our goal in terms of our climate action strategy and our greenhouse gas reductions was to have a 25% reduction over 1990 levels. But in fact, because of our tremendous growth in renewable electricity, our work in energy efficiency, our greenhouse gas emissions were actually 36% below 1990 levels. So we're ahead of our own um, goals, which is tremendously exciting. And what's really impressive about that 36% reduction is that it's an efficiency story because over the same period of time, San Francisco's economy more than doubled and our population increased by 20%. And at that same time, we've reduced our energy use in commercial buildings overall by almost 10%. So this demonstrates how cities with intention with collective action from businesses, residents, and elected officials can make a difference and can start to heal the planet. And I also wanna point out that it's important to take that broad look at energy use, considering issues like location efficient design, which is a very wonky way of saying that we need to connect new housing to transit and bike lanes. San Francisco has worked very hard uh, to be a transit first city, to develop electric vehicle charging infrastructure, as well as policies and investments in climate action and equity. So it's important that organizations like ACEEE are recognizing that holistic work of cities because we're all working towards the same goals. I just wanna end with some recent things that are happening in the last week in San Francisco. 
On Monday, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors proposed our next step towards carbon neutrality, that we will ban natural gas in new municipal buildings. And the Monday, next Monday, the board will consider phasing in a requirement that all large commercial buildings operate on 100% renewable electricity. At the same time, we are considering an ordinance that will require large private sector parking garages to offer uh, charging in at least 10% of their spaces. So we continue to work together, push the envelope, ask something of everyone so that truly San Francisco can be a city of the future and we can learn from our colleagues and celebrate with organizations like ACEEE. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Debbie. It's now time for the Q&A portion of the program. All speakers are available for questions with the exception of Mayor Fry. <clears throat> Representing Minneapolis on the line is Heidi Ritchie, the policy director to Mayor Fry. But as a reminder, please type your question into the chat box. If you, the chat box is in the sidebar tool. Um, we will prioritize questions from members of the media. So if you are pressed, please include your name and outlet in the chat box. Uh, and with that, let's begin the Q&A. Um, so to start us off, David, why don't we, we're getting some questions on how the 75 cities were selected. Can you briefly review the methodology again in terms of how cities are selected for inclusion in the scorecard? <laughs> Sure, absolutely happy to do that. So generally speaking, we focus on the central cities of the 75 largest metro regions in the U.S. Um, there are some cases where we make exceptions. If a metro region is particularly large and has two large cities, we will include two cities from that metro region. So an example of that would be the Bay Area, where we include both San Francisco and Oakland. Um, there's only a few cases when we do that, but other than that, you know, as I was saying, it is a focus on the largest cities within the largest metro regions. Great, thank you. Uh, and is there a way for uh, people to see the leading cities for topics that cross chapters? For example, um, for people that are interested mostly in energy efficiency or renewable energy, is there a way to see uh, leaders for efficiency and renewables? Yes, yes, so there is. So, um, you know, uh, we have tallied the highest scores by different factors, um, including energy efficiency, renewable energy, as well as equity. So uh, to go over those quickly on energy efficiency, Boston um, had the highest score, which is unsurprising, um, you know, considering energy efficiency is most of the metrics in the report and Boston's long running leadership on energy efficiency. Um, for renewable energy, Austin was in the lead, um, followed by Seattle, and then a few other cities tied. And then for equity, the the top the uh, top city was Minneapolis, actually, and they were followed by Seattle, and then a few other cities tied for for that third place. So that's something that folks can look in that first chapter for more information, as well as uh, some appendices in the report that um, have detailed lists by all of those different policy areas, or uh, rather there's different categories. Great, thanks. Um, and how are cities working with energy efficiency programs offered by their utilities? So there, there's different ways, um, you know, there are some notable um, city utility partnerships where cities uh, either promote the activities of their utility or they actively engage um, their utility uh, in the planning process. So that, those are sort of the, the leading edge ways. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I think two great examples are uh, Renew Boston in Boston, um, as well as some programs in, in San Francisco. So I'm not sure if uh, either, um, you know, Carl from Boston or Debbie from San Francisco would be interested in, in telling a little bit more about their experience working with utilities. Sure, this is, this is Carl Spector in Boston. Um, we are very fortunate uh, First of all, that we have a very strong partnership with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which also has aggressive climate goals and energy efficiency programs. Under, this, under state law, uh, all the utilities uh, in Massachusetts are required to develop energy efficiency programs, and therefore we found it most effective for the city's outreach around energy efficiency and working with residents and businesses and institutions 
to make sure that, uh, again, uh, people and businesses and institutions in Boston were fully aware of the opportunities they had through the state mandated programs for energy efficiency. So we direct a lot of our work to A, make sure that everyone in Boston is aware of those programs, to set aggressive goals through our energy reporting ordinance and other requirements that we have um, through, our, through our zoning and through our reporting requirements to funnel people into those existing programs. And then we work very closely with our partners in the utilities to make sure that those programs are well designed to serve the needs of our community. And, and as uh, you know, has been recognized, that's been a very effective model. Of course, uh, again, it, we're fortunate to, that we're able to build uh, on the uh, requirements that the state has imposed on the utilities too. So it's been a very productive partnership. Great, thank you. And we have another question for the guest speakers. Has the clean energy scorecard been a factor uh, in, or a help in terms of providing direction uh, for city planning purposes? I'm sorry, you were asking if, for, if the scorecard itself and all the criteria drive our policy um, direction, is that the question? Yeah, or has provided direction for city planning purposes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it, this is Debbie from San Francisco, and I find these kinds of um, scorecards can be a little challenging sometimes for cities because they're very labor intensive in terms of uh, answering the questions properly. What they, what we get out of it, and the reason cities like San Francisco do this is because it gives us a chance to uh, take a look at our own programs through the lens of another organization and one as uh, well considered as ACEEE to see what are those categories that that organization feels is important and how are other cities doing among the, those categories. So I think it's absolutely critical that ACEEE expanded its reach into looking at a variety of categories beyond traditional energy efficiency uh, so that cities like San Francisco will emphasize and push even harder in areas when we see that perhaps we don't score as well as Seattle or Minneapolis or Boston. Uh, it does allow us to take a look at ourselves through a more objective lens and push even harder. Great. I have a so Heidi Ritchie from Minneapolis. I'll just, I just want to add, you know, I think Deb, you're right on. I'll also say that hearing about some of the initiatives that are happening across the city that um, come through the scorecard is another way in which we can use the scorecard. I've already been writing down a bunch of the um, initiatives that I've heard from San Francisco. Um, and a couple other cities to go research them and see how they could be applied in our city. So that's another way in which uh, we use the scorecard. Great, thanks so much. Um, so here's a question for um, all the speakers as well. Um, so for, for some people who may be in more uh, conservative cities, like how do you recommend engaging uh, leaders locally? Is there a best practice? Yeah, I mean, this is Debbie from San Francisco. Uh, to me, energy efficiency uh, and is a beautiful example of providing deep benefits to people who need them most, no matter where you are in the country. We have seen uh, their energy bills drop with energy efficiency so that People in our low-income housing have more money available to them to live and prosper. Our small business community, it's a, we live in a very expensive city, and our small businesses are struggling to make ends meet. When we can bring them value through our energy efficiency programs to upgrade their refrigeration, to give them better lighting, to showcase their products, those small businesses are excited, and they're very grateful to government for that kind of partnership. 
And my guess is that both Heidi and Carl have the same experience, that it's not often that government can come in and improve lives so dramatically, so quickly. And these energy efficiency efforts are a wonderful way to government for government to show value. Uh, this is this is Carl in Boston. I want to second everything that Deb said that energy efficiency, renewable energy is good for our economy, it's good for jobs, it's good for the community uh, in all ways. And it, it's very important uh, to, to emphasize that despite the, the, the element of, of competition by this ranking, uh, you know, that, that, that the folks uh, in Boston and San Francisco and Minneapolis and, and many other cities see this as a cooperative venture that, you know, we work together. Uh, I, I have shared information and, and our experiences with, with my colleagues and uh, on the phone uh, many, many times for many years, and we learn an enormous amount from each other. There is a, uh, a strong and growing support uh, among mayors on this work. Uh, there is an organization called Climate Mayors that includes over 400 mayors across the United States who have, have joined together to share information, to become a voice for uh, cities on, on climate and energy and, you know, all the top 10 and, and I think most of the other cities on the list of 75. All those cities are members of Climate Mayors, so there, there's a strong support and recognition of the leadership that cities have to take uh, in addressing climate and energy in this country. Great, thanks so much. Um, so here's here's one question for Dave. Uh, can you talk about the specific criteria used to rank the cities in terms of renewable energy, energy equity, progress, and uh, how how did you measure the cities? quote, closeness to reaching their GHG reduction goals? Sure, so it uh, seems like three questions, so I'll take uh, one at a time. So, um, you know, on uh, equity issues, we looked at it in different ways. Um, there was 12 or 13 points across the scorecard. One of the new metrics we added that we were excited about was equ equity-driven planning. Um, that was something that looked at cities' efforts to ensure they were engaging marginalized communities and climate action planning processes, um, putting them in leadership positions uh, in those planning processes, as well as creating metrics so that they could be accountable. Um, so in a way it was really assessing, you know, procedural and structural equity, which are a couple of the dimensions that folks in the field um, agree are important here. In addition, we looked at other factors such as the inclusivity of workforce development um, efforts. We looked at utility offerings for low income programs. Um, we looked at a number of metrics related to clean, efficient transportation for low-income communities. So that, that gives a flavor. Um, I, I would uh, point this person to the, the methodology where we go into a bit more detail on this, because I'm sure there's a couple metrics that I left out. Um, and then on the renewable energy side of things, um, again, we have a bulleted list in the report. There's about eight or nine metrics that we looked at. Um, to give you a flavor, we looked at renewable energy goals. Um, we looked at uh, encouragement and support for local distributed energy resources, including on-site solar as well as community solar. We looked at the adoption of solar readiness codes. We looked at renewable energy incentives offered by both the city and the utility, um, as well as city efforts to encourage its utility to use more renewable energy generation. Um, so those are just a few of the items there. And now I know there is a third component to the question that I'm forgetting. Could you remind me? How, how did you measure the city's closeness to reaching their GHG re reduction goals? Sure, sure. So um, if a city was deemed close to being on track to its goal, it was within 25% of its stated goal. So, for example, um, let's say the goal we were measuring against was a 100% GHG emissions reduction goal. If they were 75% um, of the way there, or on track to be 75% of the way there, or more than that, up to 100%, um, we deem them to be close to on track um, towards the goal. So it was really that 25% margin that we used. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. 
Um, and here's a question for our guest speakers. So how, how replicable are the city action slash initiatives being measured in small, medium-sized municipalities? And as a follow-up, are there large municipalities that are working with small neighboring jurisdictions? Um, th this is Carl in Boston. So uh, the, the city of Boston uh, is working uh, you know, with many of our neighbors. In particular, there's a group around Boston called the Metro Mayors Coalition, which includes uh, Boston and 13 other communities. We have collectively, uh, that group of 14 cities has collectively set a goal of carbon neutrality uh, by 2050, and we're working to share information and experiences uh, uh, you know, about what we're doing and how we can move forward both individually and as a group. Uh, through, and then again, through groups such as uh, Climate Mayors, which I mentioned, another organization called the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, uh, you know, big cities are sharing information with uh, with smaller cities. Uh, more advanced cities are working with cities who've just gotten started to to share our experience, and, and so that cities collectively are advancing. There is an enormous amount of um, of, of information sharing among cities, so that uh, you know, um, so we can move forward. And uh, Debbie, or uh, if you want to say a few words about that too. This is Debbie. That was beautiful, Carl. And I would just, you know, California has Green Cities California, which are 15 cities throughout California that are mostly small cities that are working together with cities like as large as San Francisco and San Jose uh, to help each other. And I think the theme here that's so important to underscore is that cities are really the scale for change. And yet cities cannot do it all by themselves. They need the help of their state government and even better, the federal government. Because when we are all aligned towards a common purpose, then the cities can take advantage of the resources and the policies of government above them and can make sure that all of their residents benefit from the implementation of those policies. Cities understand this. We are working together on a daily basis, and it's people like Carl and Heidi and myself who are at the staff level who are so committed and so excited to engage with bold elected leaders and their residents. That's the power of us all working together. Yeah, I agree with Debbie and Carl, and I'll just add, you know, we've got a, a, a smaller but uh, just as dynamic city across the river in St. Paul. And so we do a lot of work with them. Um, a couple of items include working on a electric vehicle uh, car sharing pilot and a mobility hub um, initiative. Um, we also, our transit system is a regional transit system. So we work with lots of the surrounding smaller cities around us on that regional uh, sort of transit planning. Um, which includes things like electrification, um, bus only lanes, uh, and things like that. So um, I think by the nature of how we're set up, we uh, work with other cities and um, also just by the nature of finding that collaboration really does move us along in a, a much more impactful way. And I just wanted to add one note at the end here uh, in terms of the, the first uh, question about um, the rec uh, how this could be replicated in small and medium sized cities. So we we do try to, you know, choose best practice metrics that are applicable across all cities. Um, you know, there's obviously cutoffs when you, you know, depending upon the definition of a, a small city, um, but, you know, things like adopting climate goals, adopting energy efficiency goals, updating building codes or advocating for more stringent ones at the state level if a city doesn't have the ability to do that. Um, you know, those are just some of the ways that this is really replicable across cities. Thanks, Dave. Uh, and with Florida's high vulnerability to climate change, could you offer some perspective on the relatively low ranks of Florida cities? Sure, so, you know, even though the, the, there are varied ranks within Florida. So, you know, I think that there, the reason some ranks are low, well, it, it's different among the cities. I'll start there. So I think Orlando is a great example. Um, Orlando has been pushing the envelope 
nationally, but also within Florida. You know, just since the last scorecard, you know, uh, there's been com more community solar projects. They've started an innovative bulk solar purchasing program um, and adopted mode shift targets. So I think they're a great example to point to in terms of, you know, what cities can, can do in Florida. I mean, in terms of why uh, other cities didn't score as well, you know, um, there, there's different there's different reasons, you know, I think Miami has been improving, uh, you know, I, I think the utilities serving some of the cities in Florida um, don't achieve the most savings from their energy efficiency program. So that is one of the factors, but other than that, they're, they're pretty locally specific issues. But I, I do point to Orlando as an example of, you know, what cities in Florida can achieve. Great, thanks Dave. Um, do you do you have any additional data uh, comparing the one, the U.S. cities with leading environmental cities internationally? Uh, AC Triple, no, we uh, we do not have that information. We focus uh, in the, this report on um, you know U.S. cities. We do have some additional research coming out in the future that's going to look at resilience plans of international cities, but nothing uh, like the city scorecard at the international level. Great, very good. Uh, here's another one for our guest speakers on the phone. Uh, how are cities paying for incentives and are there mechanisms uh, through which cities could use savings to pay to further incentives? Uh, this is Heidi from Minneapolis. I'm going to talk about two. There are more, but we have um, recently increased our franchise fee and the mayor made a commitment to um, take the money that were the revenue from that increase in franchise fee and put it back into new energy and climate programming. Um, so that's one way. Um, the other way is uh, we have a uh, pollution control annual registration. And a few years ago when the mayor was a council member, he kind of adjusted how that registration worked. Whereas we people were registering and paying uh, fees based on their pollution control equipment they're now paying fees based on the pollution that they're emitting. And that uh, money is going, again, back into um, programming uh, specifically called the Green Business Cost Share, where we go into businesses and we say, hey, we're going to help you um, get rid of perk in your dry cleaner, for example, or get rid of uh, solvent-based paint in your auto body shop. So those are just a few examples of what Minneapolis is doing and how we're funding that, uh, those programs and initiatives. Uh, this is Carl in Boston. First of all, it's, it's very important to recognize that uh, the vast majority of efficiency measures pay for themselves. Uh, and obviously that sometimes occurs over a number of years, but in the long term, uh, energy efficiency programs are good for individual uh, businesses and institutions and residents because they do pay for themselves. Uh, now, we do need to recognize, especially in some sectors of the community, uh, in small businesses and uh, in some of the poor uh, residential communities, that getting the initial funds to uh, install the energy efficiency measures, uh, they need some help with that. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, we're fortunate in Massachusetts that we already have uh, we're programs uh, that can do that, but we're always looking for more through the types of things that Heidi mentioned. Uh, there is a, uh, a small surcharge on electricity and natural gas uh, in this Commonwealth of Massachusetts that funds efficiency programs, and we're continually looking for other uh, financing mechanisms. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a really good question. and. Uh, in California, this is where this is so important, the role of the state, and this is something Carl was talking about in terms of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, is in, in the state of California on utility bills, there's something called the public purpose charge. So everyone pays a, very, a small amount on their electricity bill, but what that ends up in is a large amount of money that is available for local jurisdictions to use on energy efficiency. So for example, the utility that San Francisco works with, the Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, ends up with about over $300 million a year in funds for specifically for energy efficiency. 
And we work very closely with the utility to use millions of dollars for our programs. And what we find, and that's to pay for incentives, it pays for staff time, it pays for contractors it, to have incentives for them to perform. And what's very important is to pay attention to the people who are still priced out of access to these incentive programs. And that's something Carl was alluding to, that sometimes uh, businesses can't even afford the, the small copay because they don't have the cash. And so they're not going to be able to benefit from the energy efficiency over time. So one of the things we did in San Francisco is we started a rolling uh, no interest, no liability loan for small businesses so that they can borrow uh, a couple thousand dollars and pay it back over the course of their energy savings so that they have the ability to participate in our uh, utility funded programs. And this is uh, Dave from ACEEE. I also just wanted to mention that uh, cities also have uh, the opportunity to pursue some non-financial in incentives as well. So, for example, you know, uh, creating expedited permitting processes for buildings that, uh, or green buildings, or those that meet certain LEED standards, or providing density bonuses for green buildings. Those are just some other options in terms of incentives cities can provide that uh, are non-financial, in addition to, you know, uh, what Debbie, Heidi, and Carl were mentioning. Very good. Um, so as cities grapple with having to do more with less and, and uh, and there's more of an emphasis in, on paying for performance builds. What trends can you discuss uh, relative to the performance-based contracts and the development of non-traditional business slash implementation models for both efficiency goals, renewables, and climate-related goals? Uh, who is that? To do this is for uh, the, the guest speakers on the phone, or if Dave, you have anything to add? It's an open, open question. I'm sorry, could you repeat it one more? So as cities grapple with having to do more with less and pay for performance bills, what are some trends uh, for, you know, non-traditional implementation models for efficiency goals, renewables, and climate? Yeah, I mean, in San Francisco, we are absolutely looking at uh, various ways of bundling energy efficiency projects to get deeper funding for them. Uh, we are also looking at per, uh, pay for performance models um, for our own contracting. I would say this is a, a really interesting area of growth, and especially as we can start to quantify actual energy efficiency savings based on real data and uh, smart meters rather than energy modeling, I think we're going to find more and more opportunities to, to look into this space. Yeah, this is Carl in Boston again. So, you know, energy performance contracting is a very important part of what we're doing for our municipal operations. You know, that we're, we are developing uh, millions of dollars of projects that will pay for themselves. Uh, the, the city has the uh, advantage of being able to take a, a very long look at, look at a very long uh, payback period so that we can uh, do very deep retrofits, uh, uh, you know, looking at how we're going to pay back what we're doing over, you know, 15 or 20 years. And, but it all, again, pays for itself over time. And uh, we're continuing to look at other types of models, uh, as Deb said, as we get better at measuring what we're doing and we get more experienced, this type of financing mechanism will become easier and easier to do and be able to spread uh, into uh, you know, more and more sectors of the economy. And what, what does that mean for the EV space? Anything? Are there non-traditional investments or you know, other incentives that could be used for the EV space in investments? infrastructure um we we have not found any here um i i don't know whether um san francisco or minneapolis has had some experience you know right now we are we are just doing it uh and uh and uh raising the requirements uh for uh private uh parking facilities to increase the amount of ev charging in their own uh facilities but also this is, is in part market 
driven, that the d demand is slowly but steadily rising for these types of facilities. So we know that, you know, people driving cars or uh, people moving into, uh, you know, uh, residences in Boston are looking, are asking for more and more of these things at their places of work and at their places of residence, and the market is responding to that also. Yeah, I think Minneapolis. That's... Go ahead, oh, go sorry. ahead, Heidi, sorry. No, 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 you go. Okay, this is Heidi from Minneapolis, and we, we just, uh, we're working with our utilities um, on our e electric vehicle infrastructure and having our electrical utility excel uh, rate base the electric vehicle infrastructure. And we're in San Francisco, we're really interested in trying to figure out if there are these creative models. Uh, we, what we have just done is we have announced that all of our 29 municipally owned parking garages are now open for a, a we're doing a request for qualifications, request for proposal. Um, we have a process, a form right now that we're asking charging companies to put proposals in on how they would um, use a business case to put charging infrastructure if we gave them the parking spaces. So this is uh, a new area. As Carl said, the demand will increase, we expect, over time, and we need the business case to put in these charging infrastructures, which of course aren't always inexpensive when you've got grid upgrades and transformers and things that need to go in to support, especially things like DC fast charging. Great, um, and this is an open question as well. Uh, what, what is happening with the single family home space and retrofits? Can uh, one of our guest speakers or Dave add some perspective on how to promote those types of policies? Hi, this is Heidi from Minneapolis. Um, one of the things that we're doing is uh, working with our public housing authority here in Minneapolis on uh, our scattered site, which are single family homes uh, generally and doing uh, retrofitting on those. I'll just um, add, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Carl. Now, yeah, this is Carl in Boston. So uh, uh, we have been we have been working on on this to to educate and uh, uh, assist our our you know our people in in uh, you know one to three uh, family residential buildings. Uh, on these measures for a long time, that there's a lot of incentive, you know, especially uh, when there's owner-occupied buildings, because uh, they uh, they can recognize the uh, the payback uh, from those kinds of investments. And again, we've worked very closely with our uh, our energy utilities to make sure that there are structures in place to uh, provide those services. So it's it's a lot of uh, education and facilitation and uh and but but a very a fruitful area for cities to to work in to assist their uh you know their residents um it as, as heidi mentioned uh, there's a lot of effort being given to uh, affordable housing too uh obviously for equity issues it also as i think deb mentioned that when we have energy efficiency it makes housing more affordable in and of itself by lowering energy costs, which is a major cost uh, in affordable, a major factor in affordable housing. And uh, it, we're finding it a very, again, uh, a lot of opportunity and a lot of effort being expended in that area. In, in San Francisco, I have to say, I think we've been struggling a little bit with our single family um, program. We've been looking around to see, uh, for new construction, it's fairly standard. We have ratcheting up uh, efficiency requirements for new construction and major renovation, but for existing single family, uh, looking at besides incentives, which is, you know, which are, are available, it's what kind of requirements can we put in? Right now we have a time of sale requirement that when you sell the home, you must upgrade. Um, but then, you know, at the end of the day, if we're really serious about meeting our climate goals, we're going to have to figure out how to push the retrofits of existing buildings a little harder. 
I know some cities have looked at date certain requirements for existing single family homes, have gotten tremendous pushback uh, because of the expense. So this is a challenging area for us to figure out and we're definitely looking at models in other cities to answer the question of how do we retrofit existing single family homes uh, in a way that's effective and affordable. And, and this, this is Carl again, and uh, to build on what uh, Deb said, another very big challenge that you know we've all talked about is is how to uh, encourage and accelerate retrofits in rental housing, uh, because there's what's called the split in, uh, the split incentive that the you know a building owner who may have to do the investments in energy efficiency. Uh, you know, how does, who, who benefits when those investments are made? Is it the owner? Is it the, uh, the, the renters? And it's, it's a major challenge that uh, all cities are dealing with and how to bring the benefits of energy efficiency into that part of the housing market. This is Heidi from Minneapolis again. I'll, I just wanna um, jump off of what Carl said because in Minneapolis, we just started a program it's um, in multifamily uh, residential places. Uh, it's called our 4D program. And so what we've done is we've um, put some money aside to provide a subsidy, uh, a small subsidy, which equates to an application fee at the state level for a, a property, a lower property tax classification. And the, what we get out of that from the building owners is a commitment to affordability over a certain amount of years. Um, and if they have those 20% 20, 20 of their units stay affordable for that many years, they qualify for this lower property tax um, classification. Along with that, we offer energy efficiency um, upgrades and cost sharing with them. And so we're, we, we, it's been successful that we have been able to marry this affordable housing concept with the energy efficiency concept and be able to use this property tax classification incentive as a way um, to kind of lock in that affordability and then uh, make sure that the, the benefit of the energy efficiency investment that is going into the, into the property um, is also passed on the tenant in, in the form of that affordable housing um, commitment and also the lower energy bills. Very good. Well, uh, unfortunately, that's all the questions we have time for, but uh, I'd like to thank all of our guest speakers and thank all of our uh, attendees for joining today's webinar on AC EEE's 2019 City Clean Energy Scorecard. Uh, we'll, we will be sending a link to uh, the recording of today's event to registrants in the next day or two, and you will also be able to find it on AC EEE's YouTube page. Uh, and if there are any additional press inquiries, you can direct them to me by emailing cscenes at acee.org uh, or giving me a call at 202-507-4043. Uh, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.